morning. Good morning. Any, anybody else hot in here? Yes. No. I'm sweating. <laughs> I'm sweating bullets. Uh, did you hear the gospel this morning? Yes. yes. Wow. You know, like in my agnostic days, uh, I believed in the old saying that he who dies the most toys wins. <laughs> And I had a lot of toys, right? I had toys for each season of the year. In the winter time, I had my downhill skis, my course, con I had my snowmobiles, right? In the summertime, I had my pontoon boat and my camper and two cars. So is Jesus talking to me? Is he saying that with all my toys, I can't get into heaven? Is that what he's saying to me? No wonder I'm sweating bullets. <laughs> Thank God that, um, you know, the skis are gone, snowmobiles are gone, the boat went with the sale of the house in Maine, and we have the camper up for sale, so I'm getting rid of everything, <laughs> just because of this gospel. <laughs> all right so let me let me uh some of you already know this all right uh and some of you who don't i just want to explain it a little bit okay mm -hmm. what jesus is saying is that he's not saying that it's impossible for a rich man to get into the, into heaven all right he's saying it's hard now, if we take what most of us used to take as a kid, the words that it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle, we know that's impossible, all right? We could probably pluck a hair off a camel and still not get the hair through the eye of a needle. Okay, now, most scripture scholars will tell us all right, that is not, that is our interpretation of needle. But that was not Jesus's, you know, usage of the word needle. We all know that Jerusalem during Jesus's time was a fortress city. All right, it was a completely walled city. And in that wall that surrounded that city, there were about 12 different gates. All right, so, you know, they had names for it. In other words, one gate that led to the road to, Ma to Damascus was called the Damascus Gate. The road that led to Jaffa was called the Jaffa Gate. There was a gate that entered the temple that was called the Golden Gate. All right, there was also a gate that was called the Needle Gate. All right. Now at nighttime in a fortress city, all of the gates are closed by these gigantic wooden doors, all right, to protect the city at night. However, there were people, travelers and other people who would come to the city after dark, all right, and they needed a way to get in. And instead of opening up these massive doors, all right, they would cut a hole in one of the doors and put a door in the door so that they could open up the small door and let any travelers through. All right, so that became the eye of the needle gate. All right, the eye of the needle gate was this little door that was used at night. All right, a camel could go through the big gate. All right, but the little gate, the eye of the needle, all right, was only fit for a person. It wasn't impossible to get a camel through that gate. All right, you would have to get the camel to kneel down and pull that camel through the <laughs> gate like that. Not impossible, but very difficult. All right, so that's basically what Jesus was talking about All right, when he gives this saying. It's not impossible for a rich man to get into heaven. All right, it's just hard. All right, now, the reason why it's harder. All right, you 
heard us talk about Richard Raw before. All right, Richard Raw, all right, is a Franciscan. Uh, he's my age, so he's an old man. <laughs> all right, um, he's battling cancer, but he is one of the living mystics of the church today. And Richard Raw, a couple of weeks ago, he, you know, like he gives weekly uh, meditation, daily meditations, all right? And many of us in this church have signed up to his daily meditations, and we use that as our meditation. A couple of weeks ago, he gave one on money, all right? And it was his own reflections on money. Now, if I can paraphrase him, I'm going to try, all right? And I'm going to try by telling you a parable. Right. So we have two individuals, all right, who are consumed with making money. All right, consumed with making money. This individual works long hours, gets to work well before nine o'clock, doesn't leave until maybe eight or nine o'clock at night. All right, and his weekends are spent with relaxation. Saturdays, he races his yacht. Sundays, he's at some tournament, whether it's a golf or a tennis tournament. This individual works long hours also. All right, spends all of his time working, trying to make money. Now, this individual, all right, at the end of the week, he goes over his books and he sees that he has made tens of thousands of dollars for his company. And he's very happy because he gets a good slice of what he brings in. This individual, at the end of his month, he looks at his books and he's very happy because from his two full-time jobs, he is able to pay next month's rent. And he looks back at the month and he's happy because there are only three days in that month that he had to feed his family cornflakes for dinner. Two individuals consumed with making money. Which one do you think that Jesus was talking about? Right. It's not that money is bad. Right. It's only because if money becomes the end-all and the be-all, that it turns a person's heart into rock. Okay, now, Jesus also says something else that is kind of hard. So he tells the rich man, and he says, listen, he says, if you really want to, he says, sell all of your stuff. All right, give it to the poor and come, follow me. I want to read you a little bit something. All right, I'm not going to read you the whole book. All right, I threatened that other times, but not this morning. All right, this comes from Luke's second gospel. What is what they call Luke's second gospel? It's, Acts, it's the Acts of the Apostles. All right, it's the second chapter. Many miracles and wonders were done through the apostles. And this caused everyone to be filled with awe. All the believers continued together in close fellowship and shared their belongings with one another. They would sell their property and possessions 
and distribute the money among all according to when each one needed. Every day they continued to meet at the temple, but they had their meals together in their homes, eating the food with glad and humble hearts, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And every day, the Lord and added to their group those who were being saved. Does that reading stir up feelings from last Sunday? Yes. Right, last Sunday, there were over 120 of us gathered together outside for a meal, for the Eucharistic meal. But the early church, with the early Christians, of course they weren't called Christians then, they were probably called, you know, like the way is one way to put it, or the Messianic Jews, all right? But they stayed together. And, and when I read that passage, my mind just goes to, you know, like, when immigrants come to this country, they go to their own kind, okay? That's why in New York City, we have a Chinatown, we have Little Italy, we have Hells Angels, or Hells Angels. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Hell's, all right, now I've gone blank. Uh, Hell's Kitchen. Hell's Kitchen for the Irish, and we have Germantown for the Germans. And new immigrants sort of go to their own. Right, and I, that's what I imagine the early Christians did, that they had a section of Jerusalem, all right, where they were together. It would almost be like, and this is a dream, far-fetched dream, all right, that if all of us sold what we had and we bought a section of Holiday City or Leisure Village, you know, and we all lived in the same place, all right, and that we would all be together, and that we would eat together, and that we would celebrate the Eucharist together. You know, right? That's my image of the early church, right? You know, it's, it's incredible. I think that this is what Jesus was talking about. He wanted all of us to share, all right, and that's what he said, you know, give to you, come follow me. All right? And that's what they were doing. And in following him, they sat down at night and they had a meal. But in that meal was the Eucharistic meal. All right? They realized that Jesus was with them then. He's with them now. All right? He's with us right now. All right? And that's the important thing out of this gospel. All right? Is that all right, money can do a lot of things for us. Money can help us to pay for our next month's rent. It can buy us food. But when it becomes a be-all and an end-all, it's not so good. Because then we're not following him. We're not following each other. We're following me. All right? It's me, me, me. So when money creates the me, 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 it's not really good. So all I have to you know, say this morning is that we have a great community. We come together. Would it be that we could have every mass on the grass so that we could all be together? Because we have three different families. I don't know if you know that or not. All right, we have the five o'clock Saturday family, we have the nine o'clock Sunday family, and we have the 11 o'clock Sunday family, okay? Because we're all preachers of habit. All right, so if I'm mute, now Gabe, if Gabe wasn't here on a Sunday morning at nine o'clock, I would say, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> all right? We all show up because we're creatures of habit. We have three different families, but when all three families come together for the mass on the grass, it's just a wonderful feeling. 
All right, so Jesus says, the last thing he says is, come, follow me. All right, and when we follow him, all right, we make a difference. All right, we make a difference among ourselves. We make a difference when we go out into the community. All right, it's interesting. I was thinking of this the other day. <clears throat> Vatican II, all right, said that the liturgy should be in the vernacular, all right? So for us in English-speaking peoples, it was put into English. The only problem was that most of the hymns were still in Latin, mm -hmm. okay? So what they had to do was they had to adopt a lot of Protestant hymns because the Protestant celebration of the Eucharist all right, was always in their own vernacular ever since Martin Luther. All right, Martin <laughs> Luther said, let the people worship in their own language. So naturally, they had hymns in their own language, and there were English hymns that we adopted, all right, from the Protestants, because we didn't have any hymns that weren't in Latin. We didn't have many anyway. And then we had, you know, during that period of time, we had the folk mass. All right, you could talk mass. All right, and that presented problems because there were no, so then we adopted songs, all right? We adopted Kumbaya. All right, we adopted Michael Row Your Boat Ashore. Do you remember that one? All right. Where was the Christian message in that? Alleluia, alleluia. That was the only Christian thing in the whole song, all right? And one of the earliest songs that was, you know, like written at that time, because they, you know, they writing very simple songs just to get a song out there, right? Um, no, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it's. Um, yeah, not you know, like uh, I'm drawing a blank, but. Um, it was just a very, now I got it. <laughs> they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They will know that we are Christians by our love. Right, the last part, the Acts of the Apostles from chapter 2 that I read to you, all right, was that the numbers of Christians increase. And why did they increase? All right, they increased because of the love. All right, the love that the Christians express for themselves, the love of welcoming anybody into their community. All right, so that's, that's what we're called to do. When we follow Jesus, all right, we follow him because of love. The love for him, and the love for his mystical body. All right? So that's making a difference. Namaste. Namaste.